The long, hot summer of 1983 made its energy-sapping presence felt around the NFL last weekend. In Anaheim, the Saints and Rams sweltered in a smog-enshrouded 98-degree inferno. At times, it seemed as if the action was transpiring in the sun-scorched Sahara Desert. And when number 84, George Farmer, caught sight of a touchdown oasis, he found it was only a mirage that vanished in the haze. It appeared that the rams were destined to bite the dust, for this steamy climate was well suited to a snake, also known as Ken Stabler, whose fourth quarter scoring pass to Eugene Goodlow, number 88, gave New Orleans a 27 to 21 advantage. But in the waning moments of the contest, the Saints' lead wilted in the wake of a Rams comeback. A 57-yard catch and run by number 82 Otis Grant enabled rookie running back Eric Dickerson, number 29, to bear down and blister New Orleans with his third touchdown of the game. Dickerson's score provided the Rams with a 30 to 27 victory. Despite the fact that the eyes of those watching Dickerson on this afternoon were tearing from smog, the youngster is most definitely a welcome sight in Southern California. In Muggy Memorial Stadium, Denver quarterback John Elway got a less than warm reception from the good citizens of Baltimore, who emphatically let the highly touted rookie know just how they felt about his draft day refusal to play in their fair city. The aggressive Colts defense also pulled the welcome mat out from under Elway's feet. Eventually, Steve DeBerg relieved Elway, but he initially proved just as incapable of making a dent in the Baltimore defense. And when number 56 Vernon Maxwell's jarring tackle made a dent in Rick Paris, the Colts produced the game's first touchdown. Number 30 Larry Anderson's fourth quarter fumble return provided Baltimore with a 10-3 lead. But with less than six minutes to play, DeBerg demonstrated that he may be on his way to becoming pro football's premier relief pitcher. After this 24-yard touchdown pass to number 81 Steve Watson, DeBerg continued to be as hot as the 100-degree mercury reading that broiled Baltimore. A 54-yard pass to Watson, who caught six passes for over 160 yards on the day, set up DeBerg's game-winning score with 29 seconds left. For the last several months, the hoopla surrounding John Elway has made Steve DeBerg a forgotten man in Denver. But his torrid performance in leading the Broncos to a 17-10 win on this searing summer evening will make Baltimore remember him for a long time to come. The Cleveland Browns have sweated out many a close game during the past few years. And last Sunday at Detroit, the Lions' Eric Hipple made them feel very feverish indeed. Hipple and Leonard Thompson, number 39, combined for an 80-yard touchdown to get Detroit on the scoreboard first. Then the NFL's latest sack sensation, number 79, William Gay, set out to ensure that Brian Seif would remain steeped in hot water. But Seif couldn't be kept down, and he threw a pair of first-half scoring passes, including a 42-yarder to number 83, Ricky Feature. Seip added two more touchdown tosses in the second half, and a 22-yard reception by number 85, Dave Logan, sent the Browns on their way to a close 31-26 victory. 
Zipe has already thrown seven touchdown passes in the budding 1983 campaign. And this cool competitor's apparent comeback after two straight off seasons is providing the dog days of summer with a breath of fresh air. Perhaps San Francisco's victory in Super Bowl 16 gave them big heads because since then they've lost seven of their last 10. After an opening day loss this year, coach Bill Walsh delivered a stern lecture about motivation. With their heads screwed on right, the 49ers put it to the Vikings on national television. Number 26, Wendell Tyler, broke one for 39 yards, the longest run by a 49er in over a year. And with Minnesota keying on him near the goal line, a perfectly executed play-action pass made number 49, Earl Cooper, a wide open and unattended target. San Francisco played solid, inventive, motivated football something number 88 Freddie Solomon has been doing for nearly a decade. The most motivated of all the 49ers were Joe Montana, who aimed four touchdown passes, and Eric Wright, number 21, who picked off three. Won a 60-yard score that helped embarrass the home Vikings 48-17. It was a Thursday night of reawakening for San Francisco, who finally flashed the form that made them champions two short years ago. And you can be sure that even after this lopsided win, there won't be a big head in the bunch. Like the 49ers, Chicago evened its record to one and one. And the man responsible has never once required a motivational lecture. Walter Payton is that man, and his 73-yard pass reception, the longest ever against Tampa Bay, sparked the Bears to a 17-10 win. While Payton is clearly the leader Chicago looks to, for the Giants, that man is Lawrence Taylor, who spent the day shadowing Atlanta's William Andrews, number 31. Taylor, whose mere presence motivates his team, is a game plan record. But finally, he was outsmarted by Andrews, who read Taylor's blitz, slowed him down with a brush block, and released. The result, Taylor arrived a second late, and in his vacated zone waited William Andrews. Despite Andrews' efforts, the Falcons' one-back attack could net only 13 points. Fortunately for Giant fans, a scoring toss to Ernest Gray helped them to 16 in a hard-fought overtime win, their first of the new year. While San Francisco, Chicago, and these Giants earned wins to offset opening day losses, perhaps the Patriots needed the least motivation to do the same. A heavy burden lay over them as they strolled into the Orange Bowl, because not once have they won here since 1966. A loss on this field put them out of the playoff race last season, and Steve Grogan and company set out to make amends. A nifty one-handed grab by Lynn Dawson, number 87, was followed by the mightiest spike of the new year, and more importantly, by a beautiful rainbow to walk on Clarence Weathers, number 82. The bad news for Miami was that after shutting out Buffalo a week earlier, their once stingy defense surrendered three fourth quarter touchdowns to New England. The good news was that after not scoring a touchdown against the Bills, David Woodley and the dormant Dolphin offense finally awakened. Rookie Dan Johnson, number 87, is highly thought of by Miami, 
and his touchdown catch from a yard out was his first as a pro in the regular season. Woodley held to just 40 yards passing against the Bills, fired for over 200 yards and a pair of scores. The second a spectacular effort by veteran Duriel Harris, number 82, that highlighted Miami's 16th straight Orange Bowl win over New England. Miami's win proved that while motivation is a vital key to winning, sometimes it's just good to be at home. After opening the 1983 season at Houston by tying a team record of five touchdown passes, Lynn Dickey of the Green Bay Packers wasted little time in attempting an encore performance on his home stage against Pittsburgh. Twice in the first half, Dickey hit the speedy James Lofton on scoring passes of over 70 yards. But while the Green Bay team is a free-flying crew that lives by the pass, they are also a team that Pittsburgh proved could die by the run. The Steelers stalled the Packers scoring machine by running the ball 59 times, amassing 285 yards. Guard Steve Corson, number 77, spearheaded an assault by Franco Harris and Steeler runners that was straightforward, simple, and time-consuming. It was a letter-perfect plan of ball control that left the Packer attack dead in the tracks of Jack Lambert, who doesn't like spending any part of the game on the bench. Pittsburgh forged ahead in the fourth quarter, 23 to 21, and number 90 young linebacker Bob Coors in true old style Steeler fashion, sealed the victory by sacking Lynn Dickey for a safety. The new Pittsburgh defense has the look and feel of the steel curtain of old, which could spell doom for opposing quarterbacks down the road. A return to form that has made him the most productive quarterback in Buffalo history is what the Bills and new head coach Kay Stevenson have been looking for in Joe Ferguson. Against the Bengals, Ferguson found some of his old soft touch by completing 21 of 33 passes. Six to his fleet-footed favorite, Jerry Butler, including one good for 14 yards in the game's only touchdown. The Bills slipped by the Bengals by a slim score of 10 to six. Cincinnati, like Miami a week before, was unable to penetrate the Buffalo end zone. This team, which only two short seasons ago seemed on the verge of dominating their division, now appears on a collision course with disaster. points on the board may be the league's biggest early season mystery, but for several seasons now, the hex that has hung over the Jets when the Seahawks are around borders on both the baffling and the absurd. In six tries, the New Yorkers have never beaten the team from Seattle, and last Sunday at Steamy Shea Stadium, attempt number seven proved to be the unluckiest of them all. All day long, the Jets marched up and down the field at will. But when the end zone beckoned, the football mysteriously balked at the invitation and beat a hasty retreat. 
Four fumbles and three interceptions were the difference as Kurt Warner was given an ample opportunity to display his wares before a near capacity, though somewhat stunned, home opener New York crowd. The number one draft pick from Penn State carried the ball 25 times for 128 yards and two touchdowns. While Seattle's 17-10 victory might have been guided by the Jets' misfortune of fate, in Kurt Warner and new coach Chuck Knox, the Seahawks may have finally found the winning ingredients they need to fulfill a destiny of their own. Earl Campbell was dressed but not ready to go against the Raiders in Los Angeles. A sprained knee left Campbell on the sideline free to observe his replacement, Larry Moriarty, number 30, turn in the Oilers' only notable play of the day. The rookie from Notre Dame blew through the Raiders for 80 yards, the season's longest run from scrimmage. But other than that, the Los Angeles defense stuffed the Oilers. For the second straight week, Lyle Alzado spearheaded the Raider defense. Double teaming Alzado was not the answer, as he recorded one of five Raiders sacks. Los Angeles played far from a perfect game themselves, but when Greg Pruitt scored from 10 yards out, he provided about all the points the Raiders needed in a 20 to six win. The Raiders joined just three other NFL teams with perfect records. Searching for their second win, the Philadelphia Eagles battled three-digit temperatures as well as the defending world champions. After the Redskins intercepted the first Eagle pass of the day, quarterback Joe Theismann and Charlie Brown put more heat on the Philadelphia secondary with the game's first score. It wasn't until the third quarter that the Eagles found the end zone for the first time. A 27-yard scoring pass from Ron Jaworski to Mike Quick, number 82, earned Philadelphia a short-lived 10-7 lead. But no team can expect to win with three fumbled snaps, two missed field goals, two interceptions, and a comatose running game. On top of that, Washington's first-year defensive back, Ken Coffey, inflicted one of six sacks on Ron Jaworski. Coffey's blitz was followed by some thunder and lightning, though not necessarily in that order. Lightning war number 25. Redskin running back Joe Washington was the perfect complement for the thunder running of John Riggins, who clouded the Eagles' one-loss record with a game-clenching touchdown. The 23-13 win was the Redskins' eighth straight victory on the road. Visiting teams continued to win big for the second straight week. In St. Louis, the Cowboys fell behind early as the Cardinals built a 10-0 lead on the strength of a 39-yard scoring pass from Jim Hart to Roy Green, number 81. But the unfailing, unpredictable Cowboys mounted yet another calculated comeback. Danny White, who a few weeks ago was the dark horse in the Dallas quarterback race, regained his post position. With a short scoring strike to Drew Pearson, plus two Ron Springs touchdowns, Dallas burst by St. Louis and carried a 24-10 lead into the final period. The Cardinals' Jim Hart was intercepted four times, and the final blow was delivered by rookie free agent safety Bill Bates, number 40.
When Bates' fumble was recovered for a touchdown by Dennis Thurman, it sealed the Cowboys' 34-17 win. And for the second straight week, the Road Warriors of the NFL came out on top, and 10 teams created a definite home field disadvantage.